So like Plugi uh, alluded to, what I wanted to talk about was genetic considerations for the cow herd. And if we think fundamentally what a cow has to do, she has to be fertile at a relatively young age. We want her to have a, a short postpartum interval. So uh, as best we can, maximize production within a year. Um, she has to be able to calve unassisted, so have maternal calving ease. She has to be adapted to whatever stress our individual production environment throws at her, be that temperature related, uh, be that moisture related, too much or not enough, um, or maybe it's uh, stressors due to the feedstuffs we have. She has to have an optimal level of milk. And I stress optimal here because obviously not enough milk is problematic, but too much milk, and I'll go over that, too much milk can also be problematic. She has to have what I would consider optimal docility as well. So none of us like crazy cows. But at the same time, in extensive production systems, I think she has to be able to uh, actually care enough and be aggressive enough to take care of her calf. And then she has to be an efficient grazer. Okay? She's able to actually maintain herself uh, on unharvested forage. So a long list of responsibilities that a cow has to have, and you guys are, are aware of that. I just want to put this in historical context for you. And this was a, a symposium held at Michigan State in 1984, uh, and then also at, at Colorado State in the same year. And the ultimate objective was to identify a potential means for improving beef production efficiency, particularly in the cow-calf segment. So what I wanted to illustrate by throwing this up is that in 30 years, although we've made some progress relative to this, there are still some questions that are yet to be answered. So particularly as we think about efficiency in the cow herd, what is efficiency in the cow herd? And as some of you, some of you are aware, I've uh, the past few years spent some time working uh, in genetics of efficiency uh, relative to cattle. Um, that are fed concentrate diets and confinement. Um, but efficiency for the cow herd is a different beast. And part of it is related to how we define that. Is it pounds of caffeine per, per cow exposed? Uh, in which case, conception rate, calving rate, calf survival, their lactation, the growth uh, to weaning of the calf all impact that. Or is it pounds of caffeine per pallet? per cow exposed per unit of energy consumed, in which case uh, we also have to know the energy that that cow consumed in a year. Or is it calf value per $100 of input cost that you put into to the cow and the pair? There's a lot of different potential definitions. Uh, and as you look at this, there's some of that information that I think we routinely garner. But there's some of it that we don't. Um, particularly as you think about energy consumed or our true input costs into the cow, I don't think we always do a good job of collecting that, and in part, admittedly, because it's not easy to collect. So I hate to have a quote from somebody from Oklahoma State, but I think it was very appropriate. Anytime the matter of cow efficiency becomes overwhelmingly complex, we should revert to the basics. So profit equals weaning weight times percent calf crop times pounds times the number of cows, and then subtract off our annual cost of the cow-calf operation. Because at the end of the day, no matter how you define efficiency, what we're after, at least I think, is to make more money. And so this very simple profit equation gets at that. But again, and each of you would have a different answer to this, do you really do a good job at calculating your annual cost of cow-calf production? So improving efficiency. Some of you may recognize the name Gordon Dickerson, a famous animal breeder uh, that was at UNL for a long time. And here's how he kind of thought about improving efficiency in the cow-calf sector. And very similar to the relatively simple profit equation I showed you earlier. 
Um, except here he also contemplates the value of that dam. So um, the dam weight um, times what I have here is lean value of the dam. So essentially for coal value, you have the number of progeny and the progeny weight and its value. And then subtract off the dam feed and the progeny feed. And so if we think about globally improving efficiency of the cow-calf herd or the beef industry, I think it boils down to this in general. And so if you look at this, how can we improve efficiency? Well, we can do it by increasing the number of progeny per dam. And so I hate to say that because that insinuates that reproduction is actually important. And then that, of course, insinuates that the work Funston does is actually important. And so I don't want you guys to get confused there. I think that reproduction is important. The Funston question is a different one. But by selection, so genetics or heterosis from crossbreeding, we can do this. The problem, as I mentioned several times before, is we, generally speaking, do a very poor job of measuring and then valuing, once we do measure it, input. So I mentioned Gordon Dickerson earlier. This is something from him in the late 1970s, essentially partitioning energy intake through different species and where that energy is going. Okay, if it's going to dam maintenance, gestation and lactation, maintenance of progeny, the deposition of protein and fat. And if you look at this, beef cattle, as you might expect, have more life cycle energy intake per kilogram of edible product. And a big chunk of this is due to dam maintenance. So we can make a lot of improvement by simply improving the efficiency of maintenance. And I would remind you that efficiency of growth in cows is not the target. Okay? We're not trying to grow mature cows. Maintenance requirements and efficiency, however, are the target. Make them more efficient relative to their maintenance costs. So what is the difference between high maintenance and low maintenance cows? High maintenance cows generally have higher milk production, they have higher visceral organ weight. And because of that, that higher visceral organ weight, that's why high milk producing cows have increased maintenance requirements even when they're dry. So even when they're dry, heavy milking cows require more energy just to maintain themselves. They also have high body lean mass, and then, of course, low body fat mass. They're high output, but they're also high input. And compare that to low maintenance cows, they're exactly the opposite in all those categories. Now, the trick is, is knowing which production environment a high maintenance or a low maintenance female actually fits in. Now, these next couple of slides are going to be nothing new to you guys, and it's almost a duh factor. Right here I have really in the production cycle where a female is and then have three different sizes of maturity, 1,000 pound, 1,200 pound, and 1,400 pound cows. And here's the duh factor. Bigger cows tend to need more. Okay? They tend to need more in terms of uh, energy intake uh, all year long. And then heavier milking cows here, if we have the same weight of cow, 1,200 pound cow, but different milk output at peak lactation, 30 pounds, 20 pounds, or 10 pounds, there's a considerable difference here relative to the amount of energy they need when they're in production. And so you've heard me mention, I'll mention it again, how important milk production level is relative to fitting into your production environment. And I think that's often overlooked. It's relatively simple to look out and see that you have big cows or you have little cows. Now, we may lie to ourselves and what those cows really weigh, but we can look out and see differences. Milk production is more challenging. And as a consequence, 
particularly those that are in harsher environments, really need to take caution when selecting bulls to use and keeping the milk EPD of those bulls within an optimal window. And what may be even harder to rationalize sometimes is that the bull that may work best for you may actually be below breed average for milk. So just another slide again illustrating the impact of both uh, mature weight and milk production on the energy required. And this slide happens to be in mega cows per year. I'm not so sure that those units are particularly important. What is important is just understanding the relative differences. So what's even more important to illustrate that story is looking at economic efficiency. So this is some work that was done in the early 1990s by a group at the University of Nebraska where they had actually low, they partitioned cows into low milk production, medium milk production, and high milk production. And they looked at the income of those at weaning and at slaughter. So when the calf was sold at weaning versus retained through harvest, calculated the expenses through weaning and through harvest, and then looked at the economic efficiency at both sale endpoints. So again, at weaning and at harvest. And here what we have, regardless of whether calves were marketed at weaning or whether they were um, marketed at the end at, at slaughter, the economic efficiency for those low milk producing cows was higher than the other groups. Now, please don't misunderstand me. We can, we can uh, make mistakes by selecting for extremes in either direction. So obviously it's possible to have cows that don't milk enough. And maybe some of you have had to deal with that before. But I think generally speaking, particularly given the breed composition of the majority of the cows in the U.S., I don't think we have that problem. I think we have the problem of having cows that milk too much. So here's why I say that. If we look at genetic trends for milk over the past uh, roughly 20 years for the seven largest beef breeds in the US, and these are just simply the seven breeds that register the most cattle uh, in the US, if we compare the genetic trends for milk, uh, you can see that the majority of breeds have selected to increase milk. Now, Hereford, who's at the bottom, probably rightfully uh, did that. Uh, they selected, or they started at a, a relative disadvantage at one time in terms of milk production, and thought it important to at least catch up a little bit. If you look at the very top, you'll find Gelby. Um, who I think most people realize is a, a relatively heavy milking breed, and they've decided they need to um, not select for increased milk and have kept that fairly static. The Simmental breed has slightly decreased milk over the past 20 years. But the one that is really selected for increased milk, uh, you'll notice the steepest line on this, on this graph is Angus. They made a substantial change in milk EPD over the past 20 years. And this is through direct selection on milk EPD. So the good thing about this is there's no doubt that selection for milk EPDs creates change. The bad thing is, though, I'm not confident that change uh, is always good, particularly in this case. We do have some expected progeny differences, or indexes rather, that do get at the input costs. One would be Angus's dollar energy value, and I'll discuss indexes a little bit later. But it takes into account uh, mature cow weight and milk production. And actually, for, for that particular index, a, a higher value is better because it's reported back in uh, dollars of savings per year. 
Red Angus also publishes what they call a maintenance energy EPD. And it uses mature weight, which is corrected for body condition score, uh, and milk, since we know there is a maintenance requirement for increased milk production. And it, essentially, with this Red Angus EPD, a higher value means that uh, the daughters from those bulls will require more energy uh, per month. And in this example, I have a bull that has a plus 10 and a bull that has a plus 0. So we could say from this that daughters from bull A should require about 10 megacals per month more than those from bull B. And my head doesn't work in megacals. So depending on forage quality, um, that can be somewhere between 11 to 20 pounds more forage per month just for maintenance. So this is just to illustrate a couple examples. And honestly, the number of EPDs that truly get an input uh, are relatively limited. And again, that goes back to the fact that it's hard to actually measure uh, input in a cow-calf setting. So perhaps this slide should have gone earlier. And it's one that was adapted from Jim Gosey in the early 1990s, where Jim put together basically a production environment um, in terms of feed availability and stress, and then different traits, milk production, mature size, their ability to store energy, uh, resistance to stress, calving ease, lean yield, several traits. But I'd, I'd focus more on milk and mature size in this example, and basically looking at how do we define the biological type that fits our production environment. And when feed availability is high and stress is low, I'm not sure where that environment exists, but maybe some of you raise cattle in that kind of environment. We can tolerate biologically moderate to heavier milking cows and cows that are moderate to larger in terms of mature size. What I mean by biologically is that those cows that are higher output in those environments can be successful in terms of rebreeding and storing energy. But if we look at the reverse scenario, when feed availability is low and stress is high, then for cows to be able to thrive in that environment, store energy, reproduce in a timely fashion, milk production has to be low to moderate, and they have to be much more conservative in terms of their mature size. Now, we can cheat that. There may be people that think, oh, no, I've, I've got uh, uh, pretty tough range conditions, and stress is pretty high, and uh, I still run heavy milking, heavy weight cows, and I get along fine. Well, did you have to give them a little bit more to make them thrive? I mean, did we have to cheat a little bit and supplement the environment pretty heavy to do that? If so, then that may not make economic sense. So unfortunately, I'm not there. I don't get to see the rest of the presentations throughout the day, but I'm pretty confident I win the award for the most complicated slide. And you guys can mail that to me at the completion of this. This slide was put together by Jenkins and Farrell uh, in a paper they published in the early 1990s. And it is complex, but I think it tells a really great story. What they did was used animal resources from the the long-standing germplasm evaluation project at U.S. Mark. That project, of course, uh, designed to evaluate uh, differences between breeds for a plethora of traits. And admittedly, the breed differences that exist today are probably not the same as the way breeds would have ranked when Jenkins and Farrell did this work. But I think the take-home story is still the same. So if we look on the left, see if I can get my pointer to work here. So here you see um, the breed red pole. And this is in the case where dry matter intake, in kilograms per year here, so essentially the availability of feed. In this case, it's what, what Jenkins and Farrell actually gave them. But you can think about it as the availability of feed was very low. Red pole, um, a breed that uh, was a bit more efficient, 
actually, in terms of uh, efficiency, because they're much more conservative in size, um, thrived, if you will, in that low feed intake environment. But when they were given far more feed, so a much better environment we can think of it as, their efficiency decreased. Now if we look at a breed like, uh, where's Charlet here in yellow, okay, high output breed, when feed intake was limited, their efficiency was low. But when we gave them a lot more feed, their rank changed considerably, and they were very highly efficient. So why is that? Well, in a, a low feed environment, a cow with high production potential doesn't have any energy left over for reproduction. Okay, when the, when the feed is limited, a cow that has the genetic propensity to milk a lot, is large in terms of mature size, is using everything she can get just to maintain herself. And if that gets too low, she doesn't have anything left over for reproduction. The flip side is, though, a cow with low production potential has some extra energy left over to put it into lactation and put it into reproduction. That's why, in the previous slide, a breed like Red Pole thrived in the low feed intake environment. But when you put her in the high feed intake environment, she didn't. So here in a high feed environment, a cow with low production potential just can't all of a sudden put the extra energy into milk or calf growth because she didn't have the genetic potential to do that in the first place. She just does what I've done, get fatter. Okay? She takes that extra energy she's given and just puts it into fat. Where a cow with high production potential who does have the genetic propensity to milk more, to weigh more, puts that extra energy into lactation. So that's the difference, and that's why it's important to understand the production environment and then fit animals into that production environment. And so it really raises the point of optimum levels. So if we think about how Webster defines optimum, it's the amount or degree of something that is most favorable to some end, okay? especially the most favorable condition for growth and reproduction of an organism. And so it's important to think about optimal levels of production and not necessarily maximums or minimums. So with that in mind, let's look at some genetic trends for growth. These are genetic trends for those same uh, seven breeds that I showed earlier in the milk slide, except for this time the trends are for weaning weight. And if we look at this, um, all breeds have selected to increase weaning weight, some much more aggressively uh, than others. And again, I think this is a success story relative to genetic selection. But the crux is we have to really stop and think about what are optimal levels uh, conditional on our production environment. And here's the same slide, except for this time, for yearling weight. And again, some very dramatic increases in yearling weight. An interesting thing uh, related to this. So um, close to four years ago now, there was a very large uh, grant, USDA grant, centered on genetic improvement of feed efficiency uh, in, in feedlot cattle that was awarded. Um, it's ongoing, and I was a part of that. And uh, at a conference, um, may have been NCBA, we asked the question to some producers, if you were given an EPD for dry matter intake, would you try to increase dry matter intake or decrease dry matter intake? That's a puzzling question. And where everybody's mind goes first is, well, it depends, right? It depends on how they're going to grow. And I completely agree. I mean, we need to contemplate input 
so dry matter intake in that case, and output, so weight gain, at the same time. But when we put the hammer down and selected for increased weaning weight and increased yearling weight very successfully, I would argue we never stopped and contemplated, well, how much are they going to eat? And does it balance out? Really, paradigm needs to shift in terms of thinking about genetic selection from just increasing response in one trait to increasing profit potential by contemplating several things at the same time. So as we think about growth and how it may be related to mature size, these are genetic correlations between mature weight, so MW, and then immature weights, like birth weight, weaning weight, and yearling weight. And these genetic correlations are moderate. But what it does say, though, is that if we select for increased weaning weight and increased yearling weight, there certainly is the potential to have a correlated response in terms of increasing mature cow weight. And so we need to be cognizant of that. Now, a very easy way around it, okay, I should say a very easy thing for me to say that gets us around it, perhaps harder to do in practice is, is if I want to have terminal calves where I really want to increase weaning weight or I really want to increase yearling weight, I simply do that. My production system is terminal based. I don't retain replacement. That immediately mitigates this antagonism. So I think that's something else that we really need to consider, is do we sometimes shoot ourselves in the foot by trying to do everything, by trying to produce our own replacements that may be dramatically different than the kind of terminal cows we'd like to replace or like to produce? If we look at mature size related to carcass traits, the one on this that really hops out to me is the genetic correlation between mature weight and hot carcass weight, very strong at 0.8, saying that there could be a, uh, a much more substantial correlated response um, as we select for increased hot carcass weight, um, we could increase mature weight of our cows. Now, the nice thing is, is there are some technology things that can be done uh, to increase hot carcass weight um, or some management production things that can be done to increase hot carcass weight uh, that don't necessarily requ require uh, a strong genetic selection to increase that. So I think it's important to be aware of these relationships. Another thing that I think it's important to be aware of as we talk about mature cow size is the fact that breeds have changed over time. So the Hereford and Angus and uh, Simmental beast that you think of from the 1980s is not the same as it is today. And it's illustrated in, in this slide here. And I apologize, the y-axis here is in kilograms, um, so unless somebody in the audience isn't from the U.S., um, uh, it may be a, a bit more challenging to, to interpret. But these are basically breed group means uh, for mature cow weight. and That's adjusted to a, a body condition score of five and a half. Um, of cows at U.S. mark in either um, the early cycles, uh, cycles one and two, or later cycles, cycle seven, of their germplasm evaluation project. And those cows in the early cycles uh, were born in the early 1970s, and the cows in the later cycles uh, were born in the late 1990s to 2000. And what this shows is those cows born in the early 1970s, which are the red bars, um, Hereford and Angus were pretty small cows compared to the continental breed, Simmental, Gelby, uh, Limousine, and, and most certainly Charlotte. But if we fast forward to the cows born in, in the cycle seven evaluation, so in 1999 and 2000 birth year, the story is a little bit different. Angus and Hereford did a lot to select for growth during those uh, roughly 30 years, 25, 30 years. And as they did so, 
they caught up not only in terms of uh, weaning weight and yearling weight, but they also caught up in terms of mature cow weight. And numerically, at least, um, these cows, Angus and Herford, uh, were the heaviest compared to the other breeds. So I point that out just because as we think about breed selection and what breeds may fit in our production system, we need to think about the breed differences as they exist today, not perhaps the paradigm of 20 or 30 years ago and how breeds rank. I absolutely love this slide, and Funston, if you want it, I'll give it to you. Thus, as we strive to improve growth rate in the cattle industry and to make the commercial cow more efficient from the standpoint of utilizing nutrients, we must ensure that we do not deviate from the goal of maintaining an optimal level of reproductive efficiency, end quote, by Dr. Larry Cora. Now, obviously, this is when he was at K-State. Not sure if the message is the same today or not from him. But I completely agree with this quote. And if you look at work by Melton in the early 1990s, the relatively, relative pardon me, economic weights for an integrated beef firm reproduction is at least twice as important as either growth or end product. And there could be some other work, and there is some other work from much earlier than Melton that would suggest um, that reproduction advantage is higher. Um, or the reproduction importance is higher uh, than two to one. That certainly uh, outrakes both growth and end product. And simply put, if you think about it, if I'm going to excel in terms of end product, there are a lot of things downstream that have to happen first. Okay? Or perhaps I should say upstream. That animal has to have grown and done so efficiently. And before that can happen, that animal has to be born and has to survive. So we do have some measures of reproduction that can be used for sire selection by some breeds. One is heifer pregnancy EPDs. Not all breeds have a heifer pregnancy EPD, but some do. And so from this example, a higher number is better. If we compare bull A and bull B, we could say that daughters from bull A are 4% more likely to become pregnant and have a calf as first calf heifers than the daughters from bull B. We also have some stability, which are essentially reproductive longevity EPDs. And so again, if we compare bull A and bull B here, we can say that daughters from bull A are 6% more likely to stay in the herd until age six. And that's not just stay in the herd, okay? feed her for six years and she never produces a calf. She has to record a calf. But these are a couple examples um, of, of EPDs that can be utilized for sire selection that do get at um, of reproduction. Traditionally, the one we've thought of is uh, an indicator trait, which is scrotal circumference, which we know uh, that scrotal circumference is related to daughter's age at puberty, so his scrotal circumference increases. The average age of his daughters when they reach puberty decreases. Okay? But that does not mean that increased scrotal circumference is necessarily related to the ability of his daughters to actually become pregnant. Okay? That's kind of an A to B to C argument. But that's important to realize. So some people have, have wondered, well, if that's the case, why do we even need scrotal EPDs if they're not as valuable in predicting daughter pregnancy? Well, it's because they are pretty good at predicting how fertile that bull is. Um, so I think there's still merit in having those. I mentioned maternal calving ease very early on in the presentation is one of the requirements or job requirements of a cow. And so here's some work uh, I've done, I don't know, close to 10 years ago now. If we look at calving ease scores, so calving ease score of one would say no assistance was needed at all. And so if we compare that to a calving ease score of two, uh, where I define that some, some slight manual assistance was needed, or a calving ease score of three, 
where substantial um, mechanical assistance or even cesarean was needed, and looked at the differences then in decrease in conception 90 days postpartum. The cows that required a little bit of assistance um, had about a 3% decrease in conception postpartum compared to the ones that, that were able to do it on their own. But as soon as we had to apply considerable help, we saw an 11% decrease in conception postpartum. So my point here is that the calving ease isn't just important because of the labor we have to apply to give assistance. It's also important, as you might uh, imagine, in terms of calf survivability, and if it got really bad in terms of cow survivability, but there's also a this kind of correlated or recursive relationship between it and the ability of that cow to conceive the next time around. So if you take nothing home from all of this, um, you should recognize that selection for all the things that are important to a cow-calf operation uh, isn't necessarily straightforward because there are so many traits that impact your bottom line. And so as we think about sire selection, and I'm sure everyone in that room has opened up a bull sale catalog or a, an AI stud catalog, and you're hit with a ton of information. Actually, to be a purist, I'd say you're hit with a ton of data. Some of it's meaningful information. Some of it's not. Matt? Yep. We have a question. OK. Did you hear the question? Yep, yep, I did. And it's yeah, that's a that's a good good point, Funston. So there's a negative genetic correlation, slightly negative, so in the order of negative point three or so, between calving ease direct and calving ease maternal. And that can be hard to think your way around. But calving ease direct, so how easily a bull's calves are going to be born. Calving ease maternal, how easily a bull's daughters will give birth as first calf heifers. Those are the definitions. So let's say that calving ease direct is very low, so no assistance was needed. We know that birth weight is a very good indicator of calving ease. It doesn't tell the whole story, and that's why I stress people actually use a calving ease EPD rather than the birth weight EPD. But it still is a very good indicator. And there's a pretty substantial difference in birth weight between cattle that are born unassisted versus needing assisted. So with that in mind, animals tend to be lighter at birth that are born easier. Now that, coupled with the genetic correlation between birth weight and mature weight, cattle that are born small, there's a tendency for them to be smaller at maturity. So if they're smaller at maturity, that means they have an increased likelihood of having problems giving birth themselves that first time. Now, I mentioned the A to B to C argument earlier. I went A to B to C to D there. And that's why the genetic correlation isn't strong. It's relatively weak between calving ease direct and calving ease maternal. But it exists, and it's negative. Now, the only time I think producers can really get into trouble there is if they continually select for increased calving ease, increased calving ease, increased calving ease, keep driving down birth weight, driving down birth weight, driving down birth weight, generation after generation. They could find themselves in a position where they've really hurt the maternal calving ease in their herd. And there's no doubt that calving ease direct is important when you're selecting a bull to breed the first calf heifers. But as you think about mature cows, what's the harm in making a mature cow have a larger calf? So I, I think, Funston, that, that that was a very good, very good point in question. And I don't think that relationship um, is always recognized by producers. But it, it is an important one to make sure that um, after generations of selection, you haven't found yourself in a fairly large problem. 
multiple trait selection, um, as I was saying, is extremely important. And luckily, uh, we do have some things that help alleviate uh, the cumbersome nature of multiple trait selection. And those are what we call economic or bioeconomic index values. So basically, the, an index um, is equal to uh, an EPD multiplied by some kind of economic weighting. And so we could think about a terminal index and the kind of EPDs or the kind of traits that would belong in that index. And then there pardon me, there are associated economic weightings. And several breeds um, have released these over the past decade, including Angus, Charlet, Gelby, Hereford, Limousine, and Simmental, and other breeds are working uh, to release some too. And the important thing to realize is that there are both maternal and terminal index values. And that's an extremely important delineation in choosing which index actually fits your production environment and your breeding goals the best. So I've taken the indexes that are currently available and put them into categories as either being terminal or maternal in nature. So I would argue the most widely known economic index is Angus's dollar beef or dollar B. And it is very much a terminal index. If you select on dollar B, I know you'll do two things. You'll increase carcass weight and you'll increase marble. Which is fine. If you're a, if you retain ownership and sell on a grid of all of your calves, I think it is a phenomenal index. If, however, you sell at weaning, and you retain your own replacement heifers, I think it's a horrible index for you to use. Instead, if you're buying Angus bulls, you sell at weaning, you retain replacement heifers, the correct index for you, for you to use is Angus's dollar wean calf value or dollar W index, which has those very production um, requirements built into the index. Okay, so when you use an index, you need to understand what the underlying assumptions of that index are. Because a hammer works okay, if you're putting in nails. But if you're trying to cut a two by four in half, I wouldn't use a hammer. So you've got to use the right tool for the right job. So there's a lot of terminal indexes here. Uh, any of you in the room happen to buy Charlet bulls, I think Charlet's terminal sire index is extremely interesting because it's very interactive. So if you go on the Shire or Charlet website and play around with their index, it asks you for a lot of information about your herd and then returns a list of bulls that best fit your needs. So an extreme example, if, uh, if I'm using Charlet bulls and, uh, and my hot carcass weights are uh, 1,200 pounds, and somebody else is using Charlet bulls, and their hot carcass weights are, are uh, 600 pounds. Um, we both need to change hot carcass weight, but in the opposite direction. So the list of bulls that this index would supply would be dramatically different for the two of us. So of course, I can't let you guys go without talking about heterosis, um, because it does exist. Uh, and it's the superiority, of course, of a crossbred animal as compared to the average of its straight bred parents. And the more divergent those parental lines or breeds, the more heterosis you get. And it is not available from within breed matings. So we crossbreed to get heterosis, admittedly, but we also crossbreed for breed complementarity. Okay? There is not a breed that does everything the best. There is not. So we need breed complementarity. Now, please don't misunderstand me if there's anyone in the room that is vehemently against crossbreeding. I'm not saying that every crossbred calf was designed well. Okay? All of us can drive by a feed yard to figure that out. But when done correctly, I cannot rationalize why we wouldn't crossbreed in the commercial cow-calf sector. The benefits of heterosis are inversely related to the heritability of the trait. So what's that mean? It means the heritability of reproduction traits is low, and that's where we see the biggest benefit in heterosis. Conversely, the heritability of product or carcass traits is high, 
and we see a very low impact of heterosis for those. However, breed complementarity for end product or carcass traits can be extremely beneficial in terms of blending together breed strengths in both quality and yield. The advantages of the crossbred cow, we always need to keep this in mind. She has greater longevity, and that, coupled with her fertility advantages, um, provides an advantage in cumulative weaning weight uh, over her lifetime. And so that is very real in terms of the economic benefits of crossbreeding. I also wanted to, to mention um, a potential reason why this phenomenon of heterosis exists for fertility. So about uh, three years ago, two, two, three years ago, um, a group of scientists um, at USDA Beltsville working in, in Holstein cattle started doing a lot of whole genome sequencing. So that's getting millions of uh, DNA markers on an animal, something we're doing in beef cattle now. And they started looking across all these genotypes on all these Holstein cattle and realized that at some spots in the genome, one homozygote existed, the heterozygote existed, but the alternate homozygote never showed up in the population. Well, what that means is that genotype must have been lethal. And so what that says is, is that over generations, we have built up some of these lethal genetic defects. And some of them we don't know about because they cause early embryonic mortality. What crossbreeding does is decreases the chance of those deleterious alleles ever pairing together and causing a problem. That, in part at least, is a reason why we see an impact of heterosis and crossbreeding uh, for fertility traits. Another thing along these lines, we've seen a lot of genetic defects come out in the past five years. Um, Angus, unfortunately, has been hit with a lot of those. Why primarily Angus? Because most of the cattle are Angus. They're the largest breed. Um, those problems exist in other breeds, but just not quite as frequent. But moving forward, we won't dribble out one or two defects at a time. The industry is going to be hit with hundreds of them all at once. And so with that in mind, you simply can't say, I'm going to throw away all carrier animals, because every animal is a carrier of something that's deleterious, every animal. So we're going to have to become more sophisticated in the way we breed around these challenges. So since I mentioned genomics briefly, I'd say that a target goal of that then is um, determining not just which breeds to pair together, but which individuals from which breeds to pair together. I have a student now that's working actually on breed-specific estimates of heterosis, which begins to answer this question, that long-term the goal would be to go a little bit further in terms of at the molecular level, which animals should we actually be pairing together. And the last thing I would mention relative to genomics is to remind you guys that these genomic tests are breed specific. We've done a great job of integrating this information into EPDs and a number of breeds, um, but we struggle to predict well using genomics in crossbred cattle uh, or, again, across breeds. This is just an example from a paper we published um, here relatively recently. It shows when we developed a genomic test for weaning weight and yearling weight in Angus cattle, it performed relatively well. These are genetic correlations. But when we use that same test to try to predict red Angus cattle, it performed very poorly. So very much breed specific. So in terms of developing something to be used commercial on ranch across a variety of breeds, across crossbreds, is extremely challenging at the current time. So to kind of summarize, bring all this together, you really need to concentrate on economically relevant traits. Those traits that directly either have uh, a revenue source or input cost uh, to your operation. 
and obviously know that in terms of sire selection, EPDs uh, are the most powerful tool, and those economic indexes that include EPDs in them can be a, a very nice way to make multiple trait selection uh, much simpler. But you need to use the indexes um, that correctly match your breeding objectives. And as best you can, know your costs. Uh, because at the end of the day, we want to select towards increased profit, okay? not just increased revenue. We want to select towards increased profit. And again, another plug for multiple trait selection here. We're adding new traits uh, to our suite of EPDs all the time, which makes using indexes uh, even more important. So with that, I'd just like to point out a, a couple of valuable resources in my mind. Of course, the UNL Beef Production website, um, the National Beef Cattle Evaluation Consortium website, nbcec.org, and finally, uh, particularly relative, relative to, to feed efficiency and, and genomics in general, um, beefefficiency.org. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is that there's a fairly large meeting that's going to be in Nebraska and Lincoln in June, June 18th through the 21st. Uh, we're going to host the Beef Improvement Federation meeting. Uh, registration for that is now open, and I would encourage you guys to attend. Um, if you haven't been to a BIF meeting before, um, I think you'll, you'll enjoy it. So with that, that's, uh, that's pretty much on time, but I think we have time for a few additional questions if anyone has some. And, and along those lines, if you have questions later on, you want to give me a call, shoot me an email, certainly feel free to do so.